Six, five, four, three, two, and action, Joni. Welcome back to Inside the Wolf's Den with your host, Sean and Joni Wolfswinkle. Today we have a treat for you. We have Steve Trang in the house today. Steve is the best sales trainer, so we'll get some, we're actually going to take a deep dive into that. But before we get started, I'd like to give a brief bio on Steve. So Steve Trang is a founder of the Real Estate Disruptors Movement. The podcast has tens of thousands of followers with new members of the community sharing their success stories every week. Steve has a nationally recognized sales training program and trains some of the top investors in the country. Steve's legacy will be to create a hundred millionaires. One of his favorite quotes is from Zig Ziglar. You can have everything in life you want if you will just help enough other people get what they want. He heard this quote when he first got into real estate and it stuck with him throughout his entire career. In fact, it's essentially one of his core values Steve lives by. In addition to being nationally recognized sales trainer, Steve is a real estate wholesale and flipper podcaster, YouTuber, owns a real estate title agency, rental properties, apartments, and the only community bank in Scottsdale, Arizona. You sound like us, Steve, serial <laughs> entrepreneur here, right? <laughs> it's an addiction. It's yep. an addiction. That's amazing. So um, why don't you start by giving us a little background? How did you get started? Every successful person has a story, right? So you have a story. Yeah. I would love to hear it. Well, I mean, I, I went down the boring route and I guess a, probably a lot of entrepreneurs do, but you know, I did the things that we were supposed to do, right? Get good grades so you can go to good college, so you can get a good job, right? I did all those things. And what I found was in doing all those things, none of it was fulfilling. Yeah. So got a good job, excelled at it, got always, you know, excellent reviews, but you know, the money in the reviews, that's great and all, but it's not enough. That's not enough for us to satiate us for the next 50 years or 40 mm -hmm. years, however long, you know, we're, we're working. Right. And so, um, you know, uh, I think like everyone else in the early 2000s, I picked up a book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, <laughs> and you realize there's another way. And once you realize there's another way, you just can't go back. You can't, yeah. it, it, it feels like you're, I think once you become uh, an entrepreneur or understand this other world, it feels like you've, you've left the matrix. Like, how do you go back in? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can relate. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about, uh, How'd you get into, be, would, would you come prior with like sales training experience? Because you really do offer some great training mm -hmm. and uh, our staff, we ourselves have gone through your sales training program. So I'm just curious, like, did you get that experience from another industry or just, just self-taught? Uh, well, it was definitely not self-taught. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the reality is, you know, I, I actually have a master's degree in electrical engineering. So I have a very, very heavy engineering background. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I was absolutely horrendous at sales. And it was because I was so bad at sales, <laughs> I had to work on it more than anything else. And so, you know, what we learn as entrepreneurs is we hire to our weakness, mm. you know? And so I hired salespeople because I was awful at sales. Uh, but then, you know, I came across, um, you know, uh, the Sandler selling system, got really deep into that, got into Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Mm -hmm. And you realize, oh, there actually is a science to this. This is not just art and feel and totally subjective. This can be totally uh, reverse engineered. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I just I engineered the heck out of sales. That's awesome. I can't imagine you being horrible at sales. <laughs> <laughs> you can't now. You can't now. <laughs> But back then, back then, I was just a very just uh, uh, empathetic, understanding person who just wanted to know But the problem being very understanding was I was also very understanding of all the objections. Yeah. yeah. That's what killed me. So let's get into some sales training. So t can you, uh, let's start off with maybe telling us uh, your fi your five biggest objections and how you overcome them and kind of, you know, maybe, Yeah. I know it, it, we don't have time to go into everything that you teach, but sure, sure. yeah, just maybe some top, you know, uh, sales tactics and ways people can get started and start improving their um, sales. So the top objections, you know, what I'm thinking about is, you know, I need to think about it, right? I need to think about sleep on it, talk to so-and-so, right? That's the number mm -hmm. one. Uh, your offer is too low. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the market, you know, my, the, like right now, right? The market's really hot, even though it's not. But like, you know, my neighbor's <laughs> house, uh, so for X amount, um, I would say those are probably the three toughest ones that people are running into today uh -huh. uh, on a fairly consistent basis. Um, so, you know, I'll think of more, but I would say the first one I need to think about it was the one I struggled with the absolute most, because again, I'm a very understanding person. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, 
And so I need to think about it. Uh, you come to learn really just means that I'm not emotionally sold, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we got to do is we got to get them emotional because once they're emotionally sold, they'll just justify anything. Right. Um, it's the reason why we drive the cars we drive. It's not because it's the most logical choice. It's that we emotionally were sold on it and then we justified mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, for us, uh, well, we had to do two things. First, we had to set the expectations when we first walk in the door, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, with all maximum professional courtesy, you know, niceties and this and that, we basically say yes, no, or you're not, and you're not allowed to think about mm -hmm. it, right? Uh, so th we have a script, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to share that script with you guys uh, later on, maybe as a downloadable file. Awesome. Uh, but uh, basically, it's, you know, um, can I share with you how these normally go? Uh, homeowners meet with want to know how much, when they're going to get it, am I missing anything? Obviously, for me to figure out this house I'm going to buy, I'm going to need to ask you some questions that might be personal. And at the end, you know, we might work together, we might not, you know, are you going to be okay with that? And would you feel comfortable telling me no, right? Again, it's much longer than that, but that's uh, for all intents and purposes what it is. And when we tell them they're allowed to say no, we get fewer, I need to think about it, mm -hmm. right? And by us saying it's going to be a yes or a no, when we get to the very end, it's like, hey, look, if it doesn't work for you, just tell me no. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're like, then I, no, it's not a no. It's like, okay, so there's something else we must be missing. And they'll tell us what it is, and we can handle that objection, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the other part of that too, like I said, we gotta get them emotional. We ask a lot of pain questions, yeah. like you know, mm -hmm. uh, tell me more about what's going on, how long it's been going on, when's the last time it happened, what have you tried to do about it, did that work, what else have you tried, who else knows about it, what happens if you can't fix this, right? We're asking all these really difficult questions that mm -hmm. gets them emotional, and once they're emotional, they're emotionally involved. And we talk about like, let's talk about what happens after you fix this. What's that going to be like? And they're telling us like all these awesome things like, okay, so you're feeling really crappy over here, really good over here. Like what is stopping? Are we really going to let, you know, 10, $20,000 stop this from happening? Mm -hmm. And most people won't, right? Like I said, you know, the cars we drive is because we've doesn't necessarily make the most logical sense, but we really enjoy it. So that's the first one that I need to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is your offer is not enough. Mm. And that is an objection that we get, but it's also maybe reality of maybe this is not the right seller for us because, mm -hmm. you know, the houses that we buy, um, we don't buy all the houses, right? We're right. not a giant hedge fund or I buyer. We only buy houses where it makes sense. And the reality is, and, and if you look at history, only two to 4% of homeowners really are the right targeted audience for us. Mm -hmm. All the other homeowners, it makes sense to go on the MLS, go with a realtor or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so for us, first, we got to make sure our marketing is effective, that we're targeting the right people, the people that actually require our services, mm -hmm. not someone that just wants to sell their house. But once we get in front of them, you know, A, going through the pain of this and that, but we just, we take our offer away. And that is really the best way to deal with someone that says your offer is too low. Yeah. You know, my offer is too low. Oh, I get it. You know, it doesn't, doesn't sound like I'm going to be your buyer. Totally understand. You know, just tell me no and I'll be on my way. Are and you, people really have a hard time do, saying no. Are, are you still using that in like today's climate where I think people are now still stuck on, you know, you probably could have got that number six months ago, but mm -hmm. today you mm -hmm. can't. And, and as Prices oh, yeah. Come. I mean, that's yeah. something we'll say is like, man, I wish you called me six months ago. Yeah. Because six months ago, I, I could have paid you that number. Mm -hmm. Right now, like, you know, you talk about the accusation audit, you know, Sean, mm -hmm. I appreciate you trying to get that number. Uh, at the same time with the market going down, how how can I do that? Yeah. yeah. And what was your third objection? I forgot. Uh, uh, third was the market's going, uh, the, the neighbor, right? Yeah. The My, my neighbor six months ago sold my house for this amount, right? Which is, again, a totally understandable position because, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, for all the history of real estate, we've been comping it versus the last three to six months. Mm -hmm. um, but right now we can't do that. Right now we're only comping against actives and maybe even pendings, right? Pending data might even be too old, uh, right? With the way the market's going. Correct. So we're only comping against actives. So, you know, for us, we're just saying, and this is true in, in negotiations, negotiations in general, but, you know, you got... I understand your neighbor sold for this amount right now. Here are some houses that are available to right now. Like, how can you uh, ask me to pay this amount? But the other thing too, you know, we always have the homeowners anchor us to uh, a home that sold recently, mm -hmm. right? But why don't we ever anchor to a home that a cash buyer bought really low recently? Yeah. 
We don't, right? We're just saying, well, this is where we need. We, we have repairs, we have maintenance, we have holding costs right. and blah, 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 right? We try to justify our offer. But in a negotiation, if they're going to anchor us to this number, we can anchor it to that number. It's like, look, there's a home that's sold nearby for this amount. Like, how can you ask me, right? A cash buyer bought this for this price. How can you ask me to pay more than what other cash buyers are paying? Yeah. That's awesome. I, I had a question on that. When you brought up the pain points and um, – do you do majority of your sales over the phone? Do you do still, how do you, your we, Joni and I have always been much better in person, but you know, it's been a, I know sales over the phone have been a big thing over the last several mm -hmm. years, yeah. but so are you doing majority of that over the phone? How, and how do you give us tips on yeah, how to, to, to build that kind of rapport, right. ask the right questions over the phone? Well, uh, the conversations <laughs> as far as the, the talking track and everything else is exactly the same, mm. right? The, where it changes is that we can't go as deep. So it's harder to, right. to buy as many houses. We can't go as deep because, you know, if I'm asking Sean, hey, what did your wife say when you guys had that foreclosure notice taped to your door? Mm -hmm. Right. That's a that's already a difficult question. Right. To ask. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to ask in person than over the phone. Mm -hmm. Right. Because in person, you're not going to physically pick me up and throw me out. <laughs> Right. Yeah. But it's really easy to hit that red button. Yeah. 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 Right. So the really what we found is we like to be in person and a lot of our, our buying is in person. We do buy over the phone. I mean, you have to. Mm -hmm. uh, but the biggest difference we found between in person and the phone is the, the re amount of rapport built. Yeah. Uh, the length of the conversation. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just at the end of the day, we buy more houses at deeper margins, or we get a higher percentage of closes at deeper margins that make it to close of escrow. And that's the thing that I think people don't really talk about when they're buying over the phone, right? It's not just you close more, you sign more contracts, and it's not just as a better margin, mm -hmm. but getting across the finish line, that's how we get paid. Right. We don't get paid until it actually closes. And so um, if they've met you face to face, they're more likely to stick with you Right. Whereas if you're only yeah. talking on the phone, they don't know you. Right. You've talk, they've talked to you. But you've seen like people don't have any loyalty to us. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if I talk to you and we sign a contract and we don't do everything the right way. Oh, absolutely. And it's... we sign a contract and the next day someone comes in with a five thousand dollar higher offer, they'll mm -hmm. just ghost us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. a lot harder to do if we met face to face. Yeah. No, you're building that trust, right? And I mean, we when we used to buy pre foreclosure houses, I mean, I would say five minutes or five hours, I'd sit there drinking a beer with them if I had to. Yeah. So, Whatever it takes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, one of the questions I had for you was, uh, how do you differentiate yourself and not just become like a commodity business? Um, and, and it really is a commodity business. We're selling all the same things or the same features, maybe different price points. Mm -hmm. But how do you differentiate yourself from differentiate yourself from the competition? Uh, so there's a few different things we're willing to do. You know, we have a, a, a philosophy of scorching the earth. Uh, so if we need to, uh, we've gone as high as 10,000 non-refundable earnest money. If it's a good enough deal, we'll do 10,000 non-refundable earnest money. Mm. Now in this current environment, probably not going to do that. <laughs> but in the past, right, 10,000 non-refundable earnest, uh, we've done, um, uh, we'll provide proof of funds right uh we'll waive our due diligence period which sounds crazy you know in some markets but in phoenix everything's cookie cutter every pretty much all the houses are the same mm -hmm. right like if it's a problem you can see it in phoenix mm -hmm. this is not like other parts of the country where the boiler is buried somewhere <laughs> right so uh for us you know we we will waive uh the due diligence due diligence um i think those are probably the three biggest things it's just like you know when we uh work with you you know that we're going to close. And I think that's a lot of wholesalers will, will make offers, right? right? And just cancel last mm -hmm. minute and they'll be totally, they'll sleep just fine. For me, a person is making a life-changing decision based off my words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to honor it. So Absolutely. I think those are the biggest things. Yeah. Well, now that you're just talking about the current environment, let's go ahead and segue into what's your opinion on where the market is headed and what are you doing to pivot and adjust in your local market? Uh, it's not looking sunny in Phoenix. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it, which it goes against a lot of logic because we still have relatively low inventory, right? Mm -hmm. But the the feds have made it so hard for people to get a loan 
that demand is dried up drastically and demand should not be as low as it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it's not looking good for the rest of this quarter. That's for sure. Yeah. Uh, and Q1 is probably not looking so great either. But I think at the end of the at the end of the day, it's looking like 2022. We had a run up all the way to like May. And then I think all that gain we had this year is going to be lost. And then it looks like probably in 2023, we're going to start off losing. But I think at the end of the year, we'll be fine. And we'll be even probably because there's still not enough houses, right? All the builders have stopped. Yeah, mm -hmm. They've just stopped mm -hmm. construction. And we desperately need them to build houses. Right. Mm -hmm. Are, what are so you as far as preparing, um, I, I'm, I have to actively start raising private capital. Yeah. Um, we have foreclosures existing here. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to buy mm -hmm. properties. Um, uh, with creative financing, mm -hmm. where all we need to do, where we all will need to do is get them current. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing as the biggest opportunity. We can pay market value if we can get wholesale terms. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you do a lot of rehabs and like pivoting there as far as like what you're willing to do? Or do you mainly just wholesale? Okay. Uh, we predominantly wholesale, we flip, but our flips are not the best. I mean, I, I wish it wasn't, I wasn't as bad at flipping. As, as I am. Uh, yeah. But, you know, flipping requires uh, two skill sets that I require that I, I have neither. Mm -hmm. um, a good eye. I just don't. Right. Like I said, I was an engineer. Right. So I just don't have a good eye. Uh, and then detail oriented. You know, you can see where the contractor screws up. I just I can't see where they screw up. Like it's just like, yeah, that's close <laughs> enough. All right. So yeah. I think those two things and I could hire it out for sure, you know, yeah. but it requires managing more people. And the, uh, I would say right now with all my efforts and everything I got going on, adding more people does not sound desirable. Yeah. <laughs> get it. So, yeah, so that was one of my questions was, yeah, do you, do you feel like going, doing more is better? And especially because you got, you got a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Or do you, are you looking at maybe focusing on, you know, improving what you currently have and the performance, the maybe going for higher conversions, better margins that, you know, is that? Um, the focus right now, it, you know, we're actually doing a state of the union uh, presentation today, you know, where we just finished a quarterly meeting. So I'm going to present to everyone else. So each of the departments have their own respective uh, rocks mm -hmm. for this quarter. Mm -hmm. But the umbrella company, you know, Trang Holdings, our rocks is actually uh, to provide all the support necessary so that all the companies hit revenue targets. Mm -hmm. That's the rock. It's not it's not much more than that. Like, let's make sure everyone stays focused. Everyone gets the support that they require so they can hit their targets. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it's, we had a similar our, our fourth <laughs> quarter rocks are very similar to yours because it's a. Uh, it's not like let's improve this or fix it. It was, it, or I guess it is, but it's more about like currently what we have, just resolving some of the issues, getting everybody to hit the numbers they're supposed to hit our KPIs, but not necessarily add on or mm -hmm. do anything different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a there's two things I've been saying. Uh, one is I personally believe at least at least in Phoenix, uh, Q4 is the season to survive. Mm -hmm. This is not the season to yeah. thrive. You know, I, I want to go out there and crush it and all that, but Q4 is a season to survive, not to thrive. You and then Jason Lewis, a, a good friend of ours, right, from mm -hmm. Collective Genius, mm -hmm. uh, in his uh, presentation, uh, he said something along the lines of, if we can just close the gap between what we know and what we do, we'll have more money than we know what to do with. Yeah. And that really resonated yeah. with me. That's awesome. Wow, that's great. Yeah. yeah. Have you noticed that? Are you seeing... Uh, other wholesale companies or anybody start to struggle yet in your market? We, we oh, yeah. It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I, yeah. I, know I, I notice I get a lot less emails and text messages yeah. and everything else. Yeah. That, yeah. We have, um, so in the past, we would be competing against seven or eight different wholesalers. You know, this is Phoenix is like the mecca of wholesaling, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, right now, what my guys are telling me is we're going against two or three other people. Wow. And those other two or three don't follow up. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, Steve, you're super successful and, um, but I, you find the time to, or make the time to, you know, spend as much time with your family. Like how, like, I don't know if balance is the right word, but how do you do it all? Like, what are some tips that you can give our listeners on how you kind of manage it all? Uh, yeah, I appreciate that question. I would say the first thing is you have to 
be very clear that's what you want mm -hmm. because a lot of people say they want work-life balance, but they yeah. don't really want it, right. right? They're saying it because that's the right thing to say, mm -hmm. right? So I think yet if that's what you truly want, then you can make it a priority. So the first thing is, you know, we learned this from Darren Hardy is time block what's important, right? I right. can tell how important your family is by how many hours is blocked off in your calendar for your family, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I say that's the first thing. If it's a priority, actually make it a priority in your calendar. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing, it only works if you have amazing people. So I've been incredibly blessed in my career uh, to find excellent, quality, high talented people, high caliber people that are willing to put up with me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Because if they weren't, then I'd be having to deal with all the fire. So I got incredibly competent people that do not require me. And I think that's the greatest uh, honor you can have as, as a business owner. That's great. That's great. You know, so you probably don't know this, but that time blocking tip that you just gave, I actually learned that from you at the Collective oh, Genius Mastermind. Good. So we talk about awesome. the Collective Genius a lot in here. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that tip right there, um, I use that. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank just you. Uh, on that note, how do you go about finding those highly talented? I mean, it's been a struggle, you know, last couple of years to find that talent and, and recruit. Is there any tidbits that you would offer advice to find? Um, do you overpay? Do you, you know, what, what, how do you recruit those? Types I of wish people? I was overpaying because I want to pay everyone more. <laughs> the, the reality is I want to pay everyone more. Uh, everyone is compensated. All our leaders are compensated based off of a profit share model. Right. And right now, truthfully, things are slower today than they were mm -hmm. last year. Right. I mean, last year was a record year. Right. Uh, I just got my tax bill. I'm not happy with that. <laughs> though, right. Um, uh, but this year, you know, it slowed down a little bit. But as far as having the talented people, it, it, the key really isn't sourcing them because um, they've all come from a variety of different ways. We have LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn uh, our posts on social media, referrals, Craigslist, like the one that's been with me the longest was a Craigslist person, right? It's been seven years. Mm -hmm. The it, It's not really the, the sourcing as it is the filtering. Mm -hmm. So... You know, everyone has to take a predictive index profile. Everyone has to go through a rigorous interview process. We use the interview questions uh, from the book Who by Jeff Smart. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so we I use like that. that. Um, so I think just making sure that a good culture fit, you have to be clear on what your company's values are, what you're willing to hire and fire based off of. Mm -hmm. And then you can measure that, you know, uh, in the interview. You know, tell me about people that you admire. What is it you admire about them? And from there, you can figure out what their values are. Yeah. Uh, the, an another question I like to ask is, tell me about your best friend. Mm. Uh, because who do we hang out with? People like ourselves. Right. Right. So I'm just asking them to tell us about them without saying those exact words. And so having a rigorous interview process allows us to figure out who are the people we want to bring into our inner mm -hmm. circle and who we want to be very sure about not bringing, bringing in. Uh, the other thing too, um, again, I learned this from Darren Hardy was when we're hiring is if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. It's pretty simple yeah. too, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and uh, are you finding that um, since you, it is such a change in, in maybe like compensation because you're just not doing the volume you used to or something, are you, how do you talk into your team, keeping them motivated? Yeah, that's a big I guess, thing. you know, they probably understand we're, it's a cycle and we're mm -hmm. in that. So I'm, I'm sure maybe they're grateful. They just have a job, but I'm just curious. Are you, how are you keeping them engaged? You know, when maybe when they go, for um, I think the big thing really is that we're all going towards the right direction mm -hmm. and we all believe in the, in the mission, mm -hmm. you know, like for us, uh, you know, I talk about creating a hundred millionaires that, that starts off with the people within the organization. Right. Um, and I, I think the other thing as well is that, um, we genuinely care about the people and we listen to our people, which mm -hmm. is not something that comes easy or natural, especially as a driver, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just want to get things done. We just want results, this and that. But, you know, everyone in any seat at the company has full authority to challenge anybody else. I don't care if it's a different department. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's your boss. If you don't agree with it, you voice it. Uh, one thing that we, we're having Love a three D, uh, uh, a three D. Uh, it's not a statue, but we're we're, we're printing something uh, that says "Silence is violence." You know, we're going to rebrand that that message, yeah. right? Uh, but if you 
feel something and you're not sharing it, you are making a conscious decision to hurt the company. That's, that's how serious we take it. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. So how do you do when they challenge you? <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> do they challenge you? Uh, they challenge. Oh, I get challenged all the yeah. time yeah. and uh, I'm receptive of it. And sometimes they'd say, I'm sorry. It's like, no, like I need to know this. Right. Because, <laughs> but again, right. Cause they're all motivated, right. not motivated, but compensated by profit. Um, like it behooves them for the company to do better. And, and I, again, they put up with me, right. I get to do whatever I want yeah. whenever I want. Yeah. So I have to, I, I, part of that has to be letting them uh, drive the companies yeah. the way they feel is the right way to drive the company. Awesome. You know, Steve, so one question we always ask our, our listeners, which actually we got it from David Phelps, what's your next? What's my next? Yes, what's your next? Uh, what's I mean, at next? this exact moment, <laughs> at this exact moment, uh, Ren Bartlett and I are pushing sales, uh, sales leadership training. Ooh. You know, nice. I think that we've done the sales training and it, it's gone very well. Um, and I think that as entrepreneurs, what we often sh where we often get frustrated is that we'll train someone up, teach them the business, mm -hmm. show them how the business works, show them how much we're making, and then they go they off leave. to compete against yeah. us. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's this revolving door. So there's two problems. You got the revolving door of your salespeople leaving you, but then you talk about the motivation inspiring. We have this roller coaster, right, in revenue. And the roller coaster is like this when, you know, we're small. And it's the same exact thing, but way bigger when you have a bigger team, mm -hmm. right? So what we need to do is, ha is be able to, like, level that out. And the way you level that out is, again, you know, working with the team actively. So right. uh, Ren and I are, we just launched sales leadership training. Um, and, you know, that's what I'm most excited about at the moment. Is that an online program or course? What's that look uh, like? It's going to be, uh, <laughs> it's going to be Zoom calls twice a month with Ryan and myself. Oh, that's cool. That's great. Awesome. So uh, one question we ask a lot of people too, like if you were to go back into your, you know, just yesterday, your early, tw <laughs> your early 20s and, and uh, redo it all over again, but keep your, you know, what you've learned over the last several years and, and years working, what would advice would you give yourself? How what would you do if you were starting all over again in your twenties? Um, I guess let's see if I had to figure it all out again in my twenties. Um, maybe that you don't have to have it all today. You know, I think that uh, I'm always trying to chase more and get more and do more and chase after every after every opportunity to say yes to all of these things. Uh huh. Uh, and I still struggle with this today. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying I've got this figured out, uh, but just knowing that you've got time on your favor. It doesn't have to happen today. Cause I think we put a lot of stress on ourselves, you know, longing, wanting, because someone has something we want. Mm -hmm. Right. But it doesn't have to be today. We got time, especially in your twenties. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. And it, it just so you know, that's, that's probably the advice of many people right. we've asked yep. and it's like, yeah, but yet it's like the hardest thing <laughs> to teach of somebody in their twenties. Like they don't get mm -hmm. it. They're, especially in today's culture, they just, they want it now. And uh, they, yeah. they just, they don't realize what you and I have, like, all of us in this room have put up with over the years to get where we are. It, it yeah. definitely didn't ha happen overnight. Yeah, so. absolutely. I will, I will issue not necessarily a, a, a lesson, but just a warning for everyone else, too, if they're in their 20s, is that 95% of this journey sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> so you started off that it's great to be an entrepreneur, but... Not, but <laughs> well, <laughs> well... 95% of the stuff we do, right? The deal we have to put up with is pretty yeah. hard, but the 5% we get, yes, I would not give it up. I would not trade with anybody else. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so true. <laughs> yeah, we take a beating, but I, like, I wouldn't have any yeah, every day. You talked a little bit about your sales training, but I really, really believe that, or I, I know that our listeners can benefit from your sales training. So you have the leadership training. What other, um, uh, things you have going on that our listeners can, and how, maybe and get how can they get, uh, yeah, yeah, get involved with you. So. Uh, I would say um, the biggest thing is, is the sales part. Uh, that's where I'm, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to try to dominate that world. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, so, if the, so if they're interested in that, we have disruptors.com slash sales masterclass. Uh, that's where we take everything we've learned and we put it into a, a digestible form on, um, I think, Kajabi. Mm -hmm. So, I think there's that. Uh, we have the book, Active Listening 2.0. You know, okay. you can find that on Amazon. Awesome. 
um, but yeah, I think there's that. And then if they want to learn more about, um, I guess, wholesaling, then we have Real Estate Disruptors, the podcast. Sweet. Right. And you're active on all social media. They want to follow you. Yeah. yeah. Instagram at Steve.Trang on Twitter, on uh, TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> that's an exper- that's, a, that's a fun experiment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got to yeah, look you up fun. on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Oh, cool. Well, we, we'll uh, put there's that. There's no in. dancing. No dancing? Don't expect any dancing. There's okay. no dancing. <laughs> well, I think if you scroll back far enough, you'll find some dancing. <laughs> that's, yeah, probably the uh, COVID years, right? With uh, yeah. we, we, I think we even had some dancing. In those. Yeah. yeah. When you're bored, locked up. No, we appreciate that. We'll put it all in the show notes um, and how they can get a hold of you and work with you. And we appreciate the time today and you taking uh, some time for us and, and with our listeners. So, again, thank you very much. And anything we can ever do for you, please let us know. Yes, thank oh, you. Thank so you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. And again, congratulations on, on winning the national franchise of the year. Yes. 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 So congratulations. Great. That's that's an honor. You guys are doing you guys are definitely doing things right. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Steve. It's been great. Yeah. We'll see you all next you. week. Uh, if you like this, please share it. Please rate it. Uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Otherwise, we'll see you all next week. See ya. And we're out. Thank you, Steve.